Hi guys, we're going to start our next chapter for our uh, environmental science stuff. Um, in this chapter, we're going to get a little bit more into the idea of systems and feedbacks. And again, we're not going to talk, we're going to speak of some specifics, but really what we're doing is sort of laying the foundation for all of the interactions that we're going to talk about the rest of the year. So to know, say, what impact a change in soil or what impact a water quality issue is going to have, we need to know a little bit about environmental systems. So we're going to talk about that um, today just to get the terminology down um, so that you'll recognize these things throughout the rest of the year as we talk about them. So what is an environmental system? And we briefly mentioned this in the last couple of videos, but basically it's some set of interlocking components that affect each other. Okay, so that if you change one thing, it changes other things. Okay, you can't alter one part of the system without it causing um, effects in other parts of the system um, and you know we we have all sorts of things that are like this but I mean famously you know sort of we think about the idea of the butterfly effect you know the idea that like a butterfly flapping its wings in China affects the weather in you know North America um, obviously it's not quite that drastic an effect but small changes in one part of an interlocking system do have an effect on other parts of the system so what we'll see throughout the year is like changes in one species dying off or a particular uh, grass, you know, species dying off has drastic effects for everything in that system. So, I mean, systems vary a lot in size and scale. I mean, we could talk about a system as small as like, you know, the, the park or your backyard garden could be a system. And, you know, there are effects and things that you put into it and outputs that come out. Um, and then there are larger systems. There are, you know, entire ecosystems. Uh, you know, there are micro ecosystems, microclimates. There are much larger ones. There are whole biomes, you know, there are whole areas. So like, you know, uh, you know, we could consider this part of Tennessee a specific sort of, of biome or a specific sort of system. You know, the, the uh, Tennessee Valley that we're in and you see a lot of that, you know, you watch the weather and there are a lot of changes there that are specific to different parts of the system. So, you know, the plateau has is a slightly different system and then the valley and then the mountains themselves. But again, they are all, they can all be treated as their own system in some ways, but they're all interlocked. They have an atmosphere over all of them. And so changes overall are gonna affect all of those systems. Um, we can actually, can view the earth as one big interconnected system. And this goes back to that idea that, you know, small changes somewhere a long way away in the world can have effects here as well. Um, and so there's a, there's a movement or, or a lot of people actually who consider that we should treat the earth all as one system altogether. And there are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, you know, geologically, while we're on plates that we'll talk about later, um, those plates affect other plates and therefore affect things in different places in the world. Um, and certainly, of course, uh, climate and the atmosphere is sort of the biggest thing. That is a shared resource for the entire planet. And so therefore changes in one area that can have effects in other places as well. Now, this idea um, that Earth is an interconnected system, there's, there's a fairly large number of people who um, believe that that means that you can view Earth itself, okay, the whole planet, as one big living organism, okay? Um, this is famously called the Gaia hypothesis um, by a chemist back in the 1960s, James Lovelock, who basically uh, came up with this idea. And then a very famous uh, biologist, Lynn Margulis, who uh, sort of supported this theory that um, the Earth is one living organism in and of itself, and so that when we damage it, we're damaging the whole organism, okay? Uh, now, I don't think that that's necessarily a great part of environmental science. I mean, I think that we go back to the, you know, the last slide here. Earth is, is almost invariably, we have to treat it as an interconnected system. Now, whether or not we treat it as a living organism this leads into some philosophical things. Um, and I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad, um, but there's definitely some philosophical underpinnings to that idea um, that aren't strictly speaking, in most cases, part of science, um, at least in my view. We'll watch a little video in class and talk a little bit about this um, so you'll get a little bit better idea of what the Gaia hypothesis is. Now, obviously, this leads into a lot of the philosophical and moral and ethical implications that a lot of people um, on some ends of the environmental movement are going to claim, you know, supports their theory. They're going to say, hey, if the earth is one big organism, 
then you know we have to do all of these things to protect it just like we would try to protect a certain species or just like we would try to protect people as a whole we should protect the earth in that same sort of way so back to some terminology that's really going to matter for us um, on a day-to-day -day basis we are going to talk a lot this year um, it's going to sort of be the, again the underpinning for everything that we do about systems analysis and what systems analysis does is it determines what are the inputs to a system what are the outputs going out of the system and then what changes happen to the system under various conditions and if you think about it that describes just about everything we're going to do this year so just definitionally okay um, inputs are things that go into the system now when we say things because that's a real you know sharp scientific term of course um, we you know matter and energy those are going to be sort of the foremost things that we're going to consider information also applies I think that uh, you know this doesn't necessarily apply strictly to environmental science but you know if you're thinking about going into computers or information analysis or something like that there are inputs that go into the system um, and that's information um, throughput and you're gonna hear this a lot um, in various articles and stuff that you read throughput refers to how does the input flow through the system okay um, and in some ways you could think about it like you know in the sense of like water you're putting water into the system how does it flow through the system does it flow through a single pipe does it flow through a bunch of pipes is there a stop somewhere that's stopping the throughput that's stopping the flow of the input all of those things are going to be important to us as we go throughout the year and then of course outputs are things that are going out of the system we can view them as losses from the system um, or things that are just leaving the system in some way um, so in general I mean it's going to look like this that we have system inputs we're putting something in on this side okay and then the throughput is basically what you know whatever the system is in this case they're using the example of the human body you know how does it flow through the body so you put energy in the form of food or you know you've got matter you put food in your body it gets converted into energy your body uses that energy how does it give off some of that energy obviously you've got waste matter um, you've got heat that's given off it's used to heat up your body and keep it at a certain temperature so inputs throughputs outputs um, there's another couple of ways we need to refer specifically to systems most systems that we talk about are going to be what are called open systems um, and actually let's just say come out of the system or well, we'll fix that maybe okay open systems just mean open systems mean that you can put stuff in and they can take stuff back out of the system now that would be true of most systems I mean if you're talking about like say the Everglades there's water flowing into the Everglades from Lake Okeechobee and then so that water is being used but a lot of it is also flowing out the other end okay so open systems things come in and things also go back out of the system um, closed systems means that nothing is going in or out now it's pretty rare to get a closed system although we're gonna do some experiments on them what's great about closed systems is it's a lot easier to observe the changes and sort of control the variables and so like later on this semester when we do eco columns we're gonna have a closed system we're not gonna uh, once we get it started we're not going to put anything into the system it's going to be completely sealed off and everything in there we're going to see how long the system can support itself without inputs going in um, and it's sort of a great example of of reuse okay i'm um, not really recycling in a sense but but yes i mean i guess in a way of, of matter and stuff being recycled and moved into different areas of the system um, the biosphere um, was sort of a classic example of this they tried to close off the system and make it so that they didn't need to put anything into it um, another good term for, for systems, and this is going to be true not just for environmental science but for all sciences, but um, is the idea of a steady state system. Um, in chemistry, uh, we would have a specific name for this. We wouldn't really call it a steady state system. I mean, you might hear it referred to as that way. Um, but what we would probably say is that the system was in equilibrium. Okay? So, I guess that sort of depends on whether or not you got that far in your chem classes or not. If you take AP Chem next year, you know, 30-40% of AP Chemistry revolves around the idea of equilibrium. And what that means is that it doesn't mean that nothing is going in or out in the closed system sense, but what it means is that things are coming in at the same rate as they're going out of the system. Okay? So, like, I've got two doors in my room, and let's say I had 30 students in my room, and every you know 30 seconds another student comp came in one door and then one student left the door I'm always at a steady count of 30 students 
but it's not necessarily the same 30 students. Um, and this is, again, very analogous to chemical equilibrium. Um, feedback is super important. Um, we're talking about systems and the changes in them, and one of the things that is most important to us in environmental science is what is the feedback result of this, okay? So a system is undergoing changes. Do those changes feed back into the system, okay, and cause it to change in some way? They might improve the system, they might degrade the system, um, or they might just change certain things about the system, okay? Um, these are also very commonly known as feedback loops, okay? So make sure you recognize them as that term as well. And there are basically two kinds of feedback that we need to talk about. Um, there's positive feedback, and what positive feedback, and, and don't, when you hear the terms positive and negative feedback that we're going to talk about, it's not a, like, uh, ethical or value judgment on the feedback. Um, what it means is in what way does it feed back into the system. So a positive feedback means it adds something to the system. So this is sort of the classic example of a positive feedback. Um, if your population in your country or your area or where, whatever system you're considering um, has more births than deaths, in other words, your birth rate is higher than your death rate, then your population is going to increase because the more births there are, okay, if you have more births than deaths, then you now have more people. Those more people are then going to have more children, okay, more births, and so therefore that's a positive feedback and it's going to keep the population growing up. And so this is one of the reasons why population, when the population grows, it's very rarely a, a linear growth, okay? Population doesn't work in a straight line fashion. Okay, not that that's a very straight line. Um, population doesn't work in a linear way like that. Instead, population works in a linear or um, an exponential fashion that once it starts to go up, it starts to go up pretty drastically. That's because of the positive feedback. The more births you have, the more births you're going to have. That's a positive feedback scenario. Okay, that's in opposition to a negative feedback scenario. And again, remember, no value judgment. We're not saying it's a bad thing to be negative. But what we're saying is that it detracts from the original scenario. So again, the, the normal, common, classic example of this is um, of the, our bodies trying to maintain their homeostasis. So let's say you're out jogging, you're out in the sun, you're getting heat in your body from the sun, your body is uh, burning up fuel at a higher rate than normal, and so you're generating a lot of heat. Now, some of it you're losing to the environment, but you're probably not losing it that quickly, okay? And so, therefore, your temperature rises, okay? Your body knows that it wants to keep its temperature at a, at a constant 98.6, okay, on average. Um, and so that triggers your hypothalamus. It says, hey, there's too much temperature here. We've got to get rid of some of this. So you start to sweat. Now, if you didn't know this, I, I know a lot of times it feels like sweat makes you hotter, but the purpose of sweat is to cool you off because what happens chemically speaking, or, or I guess physics speaking also, is that you sweat and you're, you get liquid on your skin, that liquid evaporates. And evaporation, by its nature, is going from liquid to gas phase. And so to go from liquid to gas phase, it requires energy. Where does it get the energy from? It pulls it from your skin, okay? Now, how's that a negative feedback? When it pulls the energy from your skin, that then is going to cool you off, okay? It's going to lower the temperature. So your body generating more heat and starting to sweat then produces a negative feedback, that negative meaning that it works to go against the increased temperature. So that your body's creating temperature that's going up, but by you sweating, it's then lowering the temperature back down. That's a negative feedback example, okay? So real quick, just to recap, positive, more births means more people, more people have more births, and so that, that cycle keeps going up, that causes an exponential pattern in growth. Um, negative feedback means that in this case, temperature is going up. We, the sweat helps to cool your body off, and that helps to cool the original situation. So it's lowering the initial inputs. Okay? Um, the last thing that I want you to do is start to think about a few feedback effects on Earth. I mean, this is, you know, the bulk of what we're going to talk about this year, but consider what sorts of systems you can think that have some sort of feedback effect. Um, I think a classic one that you might want to ponder um, is something like your grades. Okay, uh, your sleep patterns as teenagers, I think you can think of some positive and negative feedback effects. And remember, positive and negative not meaning good or bad. Positive and negative means adding to the original situation or lowering the original situation. Okay?
Thanks a lot, guys.